The mainstream media's portrayal of the average American citizen is not very flattering. You know, anybody who feels the Obama administration may not have our best interests at heart are immediately labeled teabaggers or conspiracy theorists or fringe. Our next guest interviewed thousands of people and polled a million by phone and wrote a book with his findings entitled What Americans Really Want Really. And he joins us now. Frank Luntz, welcome to the Savage Nation. Michael, thank you for letting me on. Frank, tell us about your book. I wouldn't be surprised if some of your listeners had input in the writing of this book. I got a little tired of listening to the media describe the American people in very angry, hostile ways just because the American people were angry with, with life today and with the situation that they face and the challenges that Washington seems to put upon them. And so I went out and I interviewed 6,400 people. It's one of the largest surveys of its kind. And I wanted to know what they really wanted in terms of, of their job, of, their, of the government, for their children, for their retirement, their spirituality, how they live their day-to-day -day lives. I wanted to put forward a book that wasn't the media's description of what Americans think, what they believe, and what they want. I wanted this to be the perspective from the American people themselves. Well, what surprised you the most? I was genuinely shocked at how widespread this sense of anger is in America. We asked the ultimate question from the movie Network. Are you mad as hell and not going to take it anymore? And to my surprise, 72% said yes. Now, I've been asking that question since 1992. And we've never had, back in 92, it was 32%. We've never had a situation where almost three out of four Americans describe themselves as being angry. And there are two things that are driving that anger. One of them is a lack of accountability from Washington, and the other, a lack of respect from Wall Street. What is driving this anger towards Washington? The anger towards Washington is because, and this is driven towards both political parties, it's not just anger against those who are in power, it's an anger against the power itself. And when I asked Americans what they wanted most out of Washington that they're not getting, they described it in a single word, accountability. They want politicians who look you straight in the eye and say what they mean and mean what they say. It's okay to be passionate. It's okay to be inspirational. It's okay to tell the truth is what the American people are asking. And now I want to flip that around, and, and, and this is why I'm so grateful to do your show, because I know that so many of your listeners are attending these town hall meetings and are very active in speaking up and telling Washington no to bailouts, no to stimulus packages, no to uh, national health care, no to more spending. But they're not necessarily doing it effectively. And if I can be candid, another reason why I wrote What Americans Really Want, Really, was to provide the script for people who might have the chance to meet with an elected official or want to raise a challenge at the workplace or simply want to know what to say when they're talking with friends or at a barbecue. And the first thing, and I'm going to make it really simple, because it is that simple, the most powerful word in the English language when you're addressing what you resent the most in Washington is a three-letter word, why. The American people ask these questions, or this is what I want to see the American people ask. Why do you spend money, so much money, and you have no idea how to pay for it? Why are you passing legislation that we all have to follow and you haven't even read the bill yourself? Why are you trying to take over health care and you're not even telling us what it's going to mean to us and it's our lives that are at stake? That simple question, why, is the most powerful question you can ask at a town hall meeting, at a public function, and I hope that people will, will attempt to be more effective in what they say, not just passionate in what they say. Your book mentions Generation 2020 looking at things more differently than any other generation. Please uh, explain that one. You have to remember that our kids don't remember the O.J. Simpson trial, don't remember Johnny Carson, that they grew up in a very different environment, and that they only know of cell phones, they only know of computers that to them wireless has been something that they've become accustomed to, that, that they've grown up with. 
And so their attention span is different. This is, by the way, the first generation that spends more time in front of a computer screen than in front of a television screen. We always wondered how we would get people away from television. Well, now the kids are addicted to the computer. And so they look at life differently. We asked a question, I want it all and I want it now. Their parents disagreed with that statement. Their grandparents overwhelmingly disagreed with that statement. Half of 18 to 29 year olds would agree, I want it all and I want it now. They don't have a sense of delayed gratification. They don't have a sense that they have to work for something for years in some cases before they can get it. And I think it's one of the reasons that that, that attracts them to Barack Obama because he's offering them stimulus and jobs and health care and all these great benefits, and they're in their early 20s. He's giving them, in essence, Christmas every day of the year. And their parents, and particularly their grandparents, are turning against all this because they know that Christmas presents, someone's got to pay for them. Well, what did you learn about the work environment now? Now, I realize that most of the people who listen, listen because they're interested in politics. But in this time that we live in, where so many people are either unemployed or in danger of losing their jobs, I wanted to focus the book on what happens in the workplace. And there is tremendous anxiety and frustration. I want to give your listeners one warning, a sentence that they should never say. This is the sentence that is most likely to put them on the unemployment line. If your boss or your supervisor or your manager comes over to you and says, could you please do this for me? And your response is, and I quote, wait a minute, that's not my job, unquote. That may be the last sentence that you say. If you tell your boss in this economic environment of 2009, it's not my job, well, it may not be your job because someone else may be doing your job. It is the most likely trigger of a firing of anything in the workplace. Now, there's even more in the book about what to say and how to communicate to your supervisors and how they should be communicating to you because that is the number one complaint within the workplace, that, they're not, that, that the communication isn't clear, it isn't concise, and it isn't educational. And it works both ways, whether you're trying to uh, understand what it takes to, to get an, uh, an advance, to get a, uh, to get a promotion, or whether you're a manager and trying to get the most out of your employees. They want more communication. They want more explanation. They want more detail. You can never provide enough information. Enough is never enough. And I think that's the most important finding uh, that you'll see in this book. Well, how does religion tie in? Religion is a very dangerous topic, but it is such an important topic, particularly now. What we found in the research for what Americans really want, really, is that the more religious you are, the more likely you are to pray, the more likely you are to attend church or synagogue, the more likely you are to be happy and healthy, the better the relationship you have with your family and friends, the more content you are at work, the more likely you are to volunteer or donate to charity, and the more optimistic you are in the future. There seems to be a campaign against organized religion that I don't understand because what this book uncovers so clearly and concisely is that the, more, the deeper your faith and the greater your spirituality, the happier and the healthier you are, and that's really powerful. What feeling did all of these interviews with the average American leave you with? In talking to not just 6,500 Americans, but in the one million interviews that I've done in my career, either through telephone or Internet or face-to-face, -face, we have always been the most optimistic, the most forward-looking, forward-thinking society. But what this book uncovers is the fear that we have for our children. I'm going to give you two statistics. 57%, a majority, believe that their children will not inherit the America that they got, that it's going to be worse. And only one-third, 33%, believe that their children's quality of life will be better than theirs. Now, think about that. So much of the American dream is about intergenerational improvement. So much of it was about our sacrifice so our kids would have a better life. But thanks to Washington and Wall Street and West Hollywood, we think life for our kids and the next generation is going to be worse. What Americans really want, really? 
is for our kids to have the same opportunity to the American dream that we had. It's for our kids to have the same freedom that we had. It's for them to reach for the stars like we were able to. There's a lot of positive in this book, but there is that warning. If we don't turn things around now, it's going to be worse for our kids and for the next generation. Frank Luntz, thanks for being on The Savage Nation. This has really been a privilege. I know you reach a lot of people, and I hope to talk to you again soon. I'll be right back. Savage. 